This is my newly installed generator transfer switch. It's meant to power my furnace in the event of a power outage. Install is a fairly simple DIY job, although I did stumble across one semi-major problem that's likely to affect anyone running an inverter-style generator, but which is also easily corrected with an off-the-shelf solution. I'll be using a transfer switch from EverDevelop Electric, but which is sold under several different brand names on Amazon. It's an ETL listed product, which is very important when installing anything attached to your home's electrical wiring. I went ahead and verified this listing via ETL's website and am convinced of its authenticity. It has a normal off and generator power mode and correctly disconnects one power source when switched to another. I'll place a link below. It's an associate link for which the channel will earn a small commission use is greatly appreciated. We'll start installation by removing the existing disconnect switch, which should be located within a few feet of your appliance. There is a bit of a discussion to be had here. The National Electric Code, or NEC, requires a disconnecting means within sight. I'm of the opinion that since our new transfer switch has an off position, this requirement is met. I've seen other installations where people have left the existing switch in place and installed the transfer switch behind it. You'll have to decide what's right for you. At this point, we should have two cable runs present. One from the panel, or the line power, often Romex, and one going to the furnace, often MC or metal clad cabling. When installing the new transfer switch, it's really important to remember which is which. And, as always, black is going to represent your hot, white is going to represent your neutral, and green or bare copper is going to represent your ground. No room to mix these up. Inside the new switch, we have several pairs of conductors. The top two, a red and white set, are going to tie into your building's wiring, also known as the line. The middle pair, a black and white set, are going to feed the furnace, also known as the load. Finally, there's a green wire we'll need to tie into our grounds. The bottom pair is already pre-wired to our generator inlet plug. This particular box is pre-punched with 3 quarter inch knockouts. Most likely, you'll be using fittings made for half inch ones. But this isn't a problem, as reducer bushings are cheap and available anywhere electric fittings are sold. Otherwise, since I'm bringing the in-wall Romex into the back of the box, I'll use a non-metallic clamp meant for this purpose. Since this will be surface mounted, I ended up having to fabricate a basic mounting plate lagged directly to an adjacent stud. The Romex is then fed through and clamped using the fitting just installed. Here's how that should look before mounting the box. Otherwise, it's three number 10 screws and we're good to go. Next, I'll use one of the side knockouts to secure my MC cable that feeds power to the furnace. Like the Romex clamp in the back, it too will require a couple of knockout reducing washers to properly size the hole for the half inch MC clamp. Alright, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, tie these three grounds together, but don't forget we still have the other half of this assembly that's going to tie in right here. But uh, luckily I've got this three point uh, Wago lever nut that just makes things real easy. I also love these lever nuts because if you ever make a mistake, it's super easy to come back and uh, redo it with them. So I usually like to start rewiring by tying together my grounds. In this case, the ground from the building's wiring, the ground to the furnace, and the pigtail to the inbox ground bar all get clamped together. When we install the front portion of the box, there will be one more ground to tie in. Another little secret with this, actually your uh, quick disconnects so you can do it without even having that on there. When wire nutting the hots and the neutrals, make sure to keep the line and the load pairs separate. Unlike the grounds, we can't cross them. Just remember, the hot and neutral pair from the panel, aka the building's wiring, reconnect to the top of the switch while the load, aka the black and white wires feeding the furnace attached to the center terminals. And then the last thing, which is oftentimes sometimes kind of hard, is to fold everything in here so it, uh, you know, fits. And finally, once you've neatly tucked all the wiring in, install the front cover, securing with a single machine screw. Alright, so we're uh, all reconnected here. We had the mains power connected on those top buses. 
We had the load connected on those middle buses and then the bottom bus is already pre-connected to our uh, inlet power here. So the next thing to do is just go uh, flip on that breaker and uh, double check everything works all right. All right, so I just actually turned power back onto the breaker. I still have it in the off position here at the new uh, outlets transfer switch. So one thing I'm gonna check right now is just that it is a true disconnect. So I've got power on at the breaker, but I should still have power off at the furnace. And we'll double check that with my non-contact voltage detector. Nice. And now I'm gonna flip power back on the mains power and we should get a reading here. Nice. And we are powering back up. And of course, no backup is a real backup unless it's been tested. So I think now is a good time to fire up the Predator and make sure she can run the furnace. The weird looking cord I have currently connecting my generator to the inlet is my homemade splitter. It exists solely to separate the conductors so I can use my clamp meter to measure amperage. All right. Looks like about, looks like it did pop up there real quick to about 10 amps uh, on the start draw. So that's what about uh, 10 amps, about uh, 1200 watts starting. Uh, and then it's settling right back down to about 4.25 amps. So I see uh, no problem here at all running this on a small generator, even like an EcoFlow or a Jackery battery pack uh, should be all right for uh, a couple hours, uh, depending on the size. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty happy. I'm probably just gonna let this run for a little bit and make sure there's no problems, but uh, uh, Unless I check back in out here, I'm gonna say there's not So unfortunately things didn't go exactly as planned Essentially what would happen is the furnace would kick on for a minute or two and then just turn off and I was genuinely stumped I would check the voltages out of the generator. That was fine. Double checked all the connections in the box. That was fine, too um but then I spent some time on the HVAC forums and I found the problem and it was diagnosed with some very simple tools. Uh, you can use your multimeter to check this out um, or even easier, you have a circuit tester here. These are available for like $10 at any home store um, or on Amazon. Uh, so let me show you exactly what we had going on and how to fix it. What I found was that I had an open neutral fault and that's kind of a fancy term for saying the neutral wire, the white, and the green wire, the ground, are not connected. Uh, in a residential wiring situation, um, for example, in the main panel I have behind me, both those neutral and ground wires are actually bonded together. Um, in a portable generator situation, that's not often the case, especially in these smaller inverter generators. Generally, the ground and the neutral are not bonded together. And you can diagnose this, uh, again, with just a simple circuit tester or a multimeter. And uh, let me kind of show you what that looks like. If I start right here at just your uh, regular residential correctly wired outlet, we'll plug this tester in and then see we've got an off and on and an on, uh, which according to our key here indicates a correctly wired circuit. All right, now over here on this extension cord, the other end of this is plugged into the generator. You can probably hear it running outside. What happens when we plug our circuit tester into this one? Basically, uh, we have an indicated open ground, which is essentially saying the ground and the neutral aren't bonded together. And that's the error code that the furnace was recognizing and uh, basically turning itself off as a safety precaution. Uh, there is a way we can get around this. This item right here is called a neutral ground bonding plug, and it essentially jumpers the neutral and the ground. Uh, they're very useful for a lot of portable invertebrate generators that uh, will have trouble running with these uh, neutral ground faults. So essentially, this takes that open neutral fault and basically fixes it. So as soon as I plug this in, now it's registering correct wiring because now it's seeing continuity between the ground and the neutral as would normally be the case in correct residential wiring. Now I have another scenario for you. What if you wanna run your furnace off of something like this? Uh, this is an EcoFlow portable power station. A lot of other brands kinda of do the same thing. Uh, well, we still have that same problem we saw running off the inverter generator. And if I plug it into the side here, 
in fact we do. We still show that as an open connection. Can we fix it the same way though using our uh, neutral ground bonding plug? Well, uh, at first glance, it appears no. We're still seeing that fault right there. And that's basically because in a lot of these portable power banks, there is no internal ground wiring. It's just a hot and a neutral. But there's a way even around that. What if we just take the end of an extension cord, plug that into our portable power bank. Now we have, say, a, a multi-tap extension cord here. If I plug our circuit tester in, we do get the error, but this uh, extension cord actually has um, wiring for ground in it. So if I plug our bonding plug in, now it shows we're correctly wired. So just kind of keep in mind where you put the bonding plug matters as well. As I'll likely be using a gas generator in the event of a power outage, that's where I'll install my bonding plug. And then, just to keep it nearby, I ended up 3D printing a little holder for it with embedded magnets to ensure it's always ready to go when I need it. If you're interested in printing, I'll upload the STL file to Thingiverse. So we are ready to run test number two here. We corrected that open neutral fault, but there is one other potential issue that uh, I kind of learned about while deep diving on that open neutral fault, and that is just the general quality of the power coming out of an inverter generator. Uh, for the most part, from your utility, you're gonna have a pure sine wave, which is exactly what an AC motor needs to run, like the one in this furnace. However, some cheaper inverters uh, don't output pure sine wave power. They'll do like a stepped sine wave or a square wave or something like that, something to simulate a sine wave. Um, the only way we can check for sure what we have is using an oscilloscope, uh, so let's dive into that. And as luck would have it, my Predator does produce a pure sine wave, so that's great news. Furthermore, I also checked my other generator, a Champion branded one, and it too was pure sine wave, which again is really what an AC motor needs to run correctly. All right, so that's about going to wrap up this video. Everything is running perfectly now. We got our power indicator there showing us we're on generator power. The furnace is running well behind me. Just double checked with my infrared camera and I see that um, there is some nice heat coming out of those registers indoors. Uh, a little bit of a problem with that uh, neutral fault, but uh, we corrected that with some easy off-the-shelf components. Uh, so yeah, hopefully this is going to be helpful to somebody. Any questions, drop them below and I'll uh, try and help you guys out.